Hi, my name is Jason Harlow. In today's video, we will go over uh, Wolfson Chapter 14, Sections 14.5 through 14.7. So the topics of today's video are listed right over there. It starts with wave interference and the principle of superposition. Then we'll get into beats, have a little animation about that. Then we get into reflection and refraction of waves, a topic which comes back later when we, when we do optics. Then we'll get into standing waves, that's uh, the main part of this video, and how standing waves are related to uh, musical instruments. And if you look at the quote above, it says that the waves that you can actually see up there in that animation are standing waves. So that top uh, red line is like a wave on a string. It's called that because they essentially stand still, confined to the length of the string, and each point on that string is oscillating with simple harmonic motion up and down. There's also something uh, called standing uh, sound waves in which or you have a longitudinal wave so each point in, in the medium there is oscillating with simple harmonic motion uh, left to right. So the basic principle uh, of standing waves is the principle of superposition. So when two waves are occupy the same place and the same time they, they just simply overlap. So they don't uh, affect each other, but when they are at the same place, the displacement, the total displacement, is just the sum of the displacements of either wave. So it's best to look at an example. If you've got this uh, red curve Y1 pulse going from left to right, and add it to uh, this blue curve Y2 pulse going from right to left, then when they're not on each other, you just see the pulses. When they overlap, the total pulse is just the sum of the two. So another example, here we see a triangle wave going from left to right uh, and a rectangular shaped pulse going from right to left, both at one meter per second on a string. Here's Y uh, going up and down and X going left to right. At different intervals of time, you see how these overlap. Uh, the principle of superposition comes into play wherever the waves overlap. And the solid line is the actual wave, the sum of the two individual waves, uh, original pulses, at that point. So this gives rise to something called interference. When you have two, two waves, for example sinusoidal waves, when they overlap you can either have the crests uh, hitting the crests so you get uh, constructive interference or you can have the crests overlapping with the troughs so you can get destructive interference. And so here would be two waves that are going to interfere dest destructively at this point of detection right here. So there's, there's a few different uh, phenomena. We'll get to standing waves. One which I'll start with is beats. This figure shows the uh, history graph meaning y versus t for the superposition of two uh, sound waves of equal amplitude but slightly different frequency. And so and what happens is you get a, a fast oscillation at uh, the average frequency of the two frequencies and then there's the amplitude is slowly modulated uh, by a frequency which is the difference of the two frequencies. So I have a couple of animations to show you uh, to sort of explain this. Okay, so beats is a phenomenon that arises when two waves, such as sound waves, have almost identical frequencies. So here's two tuning forks, each generating a sound pressure wave, and the frequencies of these two forks are slightly different. We are going to be interested in the region right here in the red circle where the two sound waves overlap each other. So we begin, begin by thinking just about periodic motion. Our example here is striking two drums. So the two drums are being hit at slightly different rates. This upper drum is being uh, struck at a higher rate than the bass drum. So when we started this, they were being struck simultaneously. And every 20 seconds later, they are again struck simultaneously, so they're in phase with each other. And then 10 seconds after, they're out of phase right now. And 10 seconds later, they'll be back in phase. Boom. Boom. So here we have two oscillators that start off being in phase, but they have slightly different frequencies. Okay, this one is, the first one is oscillating with a higher frequency, slightly higher than, the, than this one. 
and this blue is showing the sum of the displacements of both of these. So when they're out of phase, the sum is, is very small. When they go back into phase, that sum 1 plus 2 is going to be very high. Okay, And that's as high as it gets. So now we can try to uh, imagine just plotting the positions of those two red uh, versus time and showing this 1 plus 2. So here they start off in phase, the sum is very high. Uh, you can see right around here they're exactly out of phase and so it goes lower and higher. The mathematics are you've got a times sine omega 1 times t plus a times sine omega 2 plus t. When you add these all up you can use trig identities to show that this is going to be 2a times the cosine of omega 1 minus omega t times time multiplied times the sine of omega 1 plus omega 2, so the average frequency. So the average frequency, the sine omega t, is giving these uh, quick little um, uh, oscillations. Uh, and then you multiply it times the cosine of the difference between the frequencies. This is a much lower frequency. This is called the beat frequency. So it's called modulating it by a frequency which is half the difference in the frequencies. And so uh, th those were very low frequencies. Here we're going to generate two sound waves of frequencies 440 hertz and 442 hertz. So listen to the 440. And you can listen to the 442 plays almost, sounds almost exactly the same, but if you sound them together, okay, now you get a 2 hertz uh, uh, beat frequency. Okay, so next I want to talk about uh, interfering waves in two dimensions. So first let's try to visualize what a wave looks like when it spreads out into two or three dimensions. If you have a source here and you look along a particular value or a particular direction where the distance from the source is going to be called r now, then this wave will have crests and troughs. So whatever it's, was, is the displacement, like y or something, will be high and then uh, negative and then positive and then negative and will oscillate like this, like a, like a cosine wave or a sine wave. And there's actually the function, y is some cosine of kr minus omega t, where r is the distance measured outward from the source and a is this amplitude. Well, what we can do is draw these circles uh, called wave fronts, which uh, locate the crest. So if you have another wave going out this way, well, its crest will be here and then here and then here. All the crests are located on what are called the wave fronts. So that's what those circles are. And you see this if you have water waves. If you drop a pebble into, the, into a still pond or something, you'll see these wave fronts moving out. And if you have two uh, uh, sources of waves both spreading out, then these two overlapping circles can create what's called an interference pattern. So here I show a green source with green wave fronts traveling outwards uh, interfering with the blue source with these blue wave fronts going out. So wherever the two wave fronts blue and green cross, then you know that that's constructive interference. The crest is matching with a crest. Okay? And actually halfway between you'll also have constructive inter interference when a trough meets with a trough. But when a trough from one wave, like the green wave, meets with the crest from the blue wave, then you get destructive interference. So the black lines are showing where there's, uh, there are these called nodal lines, where there's destructive interference, so no, no oscillation, and the red lines are showing anti-nodal lines, constructive interference with maximum amplitude. So next I want to talk about reflection and refraction. For, for this we'll go back to one dimension and think about uh, waves on a string. So a string with a large linear density, uh, mu, is connected to one with a smaller linear density. And it's got the same tension in both strings. So when you um, decrease the mass density, uh, the wave goes faster. So whenever a, a wave 
encounters a discontinu discontinuity in the wave speed like that, then some of the wave's energy continues forward. That's called refraction. And some of the wave's energy is uh, goes in the reverse direction from that, um, that boundary. And that's called reflection. And if the wave speed suddenly decreases, then you still get this refracted pulse, but you get uh, a reflected pulse which is upside down. So we say that if you have a if you have a sinusoidal wave, that you get a phase change of pi, which is for a sine wave, it's equivalent to just flipping it upside down upon reflection. So if you have a boundary where you can't get any refracted wave, then all the wave's energy gets reflected. So this uh, return pulse has the same amplitude, but of course it's completely inverted from the from the from the first one. And you can see a time series of a wave on a spring doing this, hitting hitting a fixed point and then re reflecting uh, with an inverted pulse. So if you had, say, uh, an oscillator sending out sinusoidal waves in both directions to two walls where you connected uh, the string, then those sinusoidal waves would reflect back and they'd be inverted, but you'd get two sine waves traveling in opposite directions. And these happen to be the conditions that cause a standing wave. So that's our, our next slide. Is This is a figure showing several, uh, several time instants um, of a standing wave. And so these are different snapshots. So the string is doing this, and then later the string is doing this, later the string is perfectly straight, and then later the string is, is going up and down. So um, what you have is these uh, nodes where there's no motion on the string, and these nodes are spaced uh, half a wavelength apart, and you get anti-nodes halfway between them where it's uh, oscillating at the maximum. So it's a little easier to see this with an animation. These are the two, these two gray waves are showing the two sine waves that are being added up, one going to the right, one going to the left, but they have the same amplitude and the same uh, wavelength. When you sum these, you'll notice that at this particular point, the waves are always out of phase. Whenever you have a crest from the bottom wave, that meets with a trough, trough from the top wave, or if you get a trough from the bottom wave, it meets with a crest to the top wave. So this is always, at this point, destructive interference. Whereas at this point, you get constructive interference. So the math of it works out like this. You have a sine wave going from left to right, A times cosine uh, Kx minus omega t, added to uh, a cosine uh, sinusoidal wave traveling from right to left, Kx plus omega t. Uh, when you add those up, it's just y1 plus y2, so you just add these two, a cos kx minus omega t plus a cos k, kx plus omega t. At this point, we can use a trigonometric, trigonometric identity, which is mentioned in Wolfson, and you can solve that this equals 2a times sine kx multiplied by sine omega t. So that's where this standing wave comes from. This is no longer a traveling wave, and it looks like this. Uh, y versus t is shown at several different instants of time and one way of looking at this is that you've got y is equal to some function of x a of x times sine omega t where this a of x is 2a sine kx so this a of x is the, uh, and the amplitude function which gets to a maximum and then to a minimum and then to a, to a maximum again and at this moment, this sine omega t equals 1, so the outer curve is this amplitude function for when this sine omega t is 1. So for a string of fixed length L, the boundary conditions can only be satisfied if you have nodes at both ends, right? So that will only happen if the wavelength is some uh, 2L divided by an integer, m equals 1, 2, 3, or 4. But since uh, you have still have the speed, which speed of the waves is lambda times f, you can uh, find the frequencies of these, uh, these different waves as being m, some integer, times v over 2l, where l is the length of the string. And the lowest frequency, m equals 1, is what's called the fundamental frequency. Speed of waves divided by 2 times l.
and that would be the m equals one is the is the fundamental frequency looks like this you have one anti node and two nodes so these different uh, integers m are correspond to the different modes of the string or normal modes and they're all numbered m equals one m equals two m equals three and they all have a unique frequency so f1 is v over 2l f2 is 2 times v over 2l f3 is 3 times v over 2l and you can et cetera et cetera you can go up to four anti-nodes this is four times the fundamental frequency so one way of counting uh, an uh, modes is to count the anti-nodes the fundamental mode has which just has one anti-node in the middle has wavelength 2l and the frequencies form a series f1 f2 f1 3 f1 etc so if you have two adjacent modes you can always subtract them and figure out what the fundamental frequency is and here's a little time exposure showing uh, a standing wave on a string so musical instruments such as the harp the piano and the violin all have strings that are fixed at two ends and tightened to create a tension and any disturbance will create a standing wave on a string and the fundamental frequency is the musical note that you hear which is the speed which is here the tension of the string divided by mu the uh, mass density of the spring square root and then t uh, times 1 over 2l standing sound waves are formed from a narrow long narrow column of air okay a closed end will uh, create a displacement node so uh, that's a boundary condition just like the waves on the string the node in the displacement uh, must be at the closed ends of these tubes and it turns out that a uh, open end will force a displacement anti-node it's a pressure node but uh, that's where the particles are are oscillating back and forth with their maximum value so with a wind instrument you, you blow over the mouthpiece and that creates a stand, standing wave inside the tube of, of air. And you can change the length of the tube, effective length of the tube, by putting your fingers over the holes. Every time there's an open hole, that's like an open end. So like a flute, for example, this L is the distance between uh, uh, the, open, the nearest open hole and the other uh, end of the flute. And V is the speed of sound here inside that tube. And if you have an open closed instrument, su instrument such as a clarinet, you end up with a frequency, fundamental frequency that's half as much. This is why clarinets are uh, sound lower than, than flutes. It's sort of go to a lower octave, even though they're about the same uh, length. And you can also overblow wind instruments to actually get the higher harmonics, where you have uh, a node in the middle so you can get 2f or 3f these each of these correspond um, to uh, to a higher frequency by some integer multiple